All right, y'all. I'm going to check, make sure if there's anyone out there in the ether, in the ether world. Hey, Bus Move is, is here. Thank you, Bus. All right. Let's see if I can do this the right way. Get her done. Thanks, Bus. I know it's late back there. I'll get going for you in two seconds here. Let's do this. Three, two, one. Almost. Hang tight. And we got it. Thank you, Bus. I appreciate you. It's nice to have you. Bus, how is everything going back there? Uh, did you get the uh, bounder, was it? The RV? Um, you were at a decision-making time. And just curious which one you went with. Let us know. Uh, because that's some big news. And I know it's a big deal. And uh, it's an investment, too, on your side of uh, time. Uh, if, uh, hope, obviously money and something that you are going to feel like, you know, uh, is it uh, a big investment over time? Uh, kind of being redundant there, but not really. Uh, if something were to wear out fast, then you'd have to kind of figure that into the equation. But then again, if it's going to be parked and not moved very often, then the uh, motor home uh, versus a trailer is, is okay. So uh, anyway, just let me know. I am concerned and curious and interested in, in the development there. So I do appreciate you very much, Bus. So thank you so much for joining tonight. This is Billy O'Neill at Trailer Gods live here over at the uh, Sacramento headquarters and trying to uh, still stay warm. It's still cold out there. This warehouse is like frigid. I'm telling you. I can't run the heater all day because it's just uh, too inefficient. So I have to make sure that uh, I bundle up and I have a door, fortunately. I turn the heat on for a couple minutes, turn it off, close the door, and uh, the cat's out there uh, getting fluffy and staying warm. Hey, we have a story about the cat for sure. OMG. This cat is a is a little terror beast. Uh, she, she takes care of business. Uh, so she not only... I don't have uh, the video uh, uploaded here, but let's see. Probably three uh, rats over the last eight days she's caught, and she brings to the front door, right, as a good cat would, uh, giving, uh, you know, offering to the master, showing uh, good work, and then if the master's hungry, well, she brought the master some food, which is, you know, that's the rule uh, and nature, and that's how it works. And so she follows that rule uh, closely. And uh, she'll give you the call out. You know, they have this kind of a crying, wailing sound, uh, cats and or animals. I know a dog might do that as well, but definitely cats do uh, uh, through, uh, you know, pre-programmed DNA. I think the dog you may have to train, but the cat just is pre-programmed to do that. Uh, that I've seen. I know ducks can do it uh, well, all over. The, the animals can be trained. So uh, she does that wailing sound, right? And then, so you know uh, it's a, not a burnt offering, but it's definitely a, uh, a humble offering and a, um, a dedicated, uh, responsible offering. All those words. Obligated. So, uh, I, you know, if you, if you take it and uh, she thinks that's great, and then, of course, you got to throw it away inside... Because uh, she doesn't want to think like you threw away the food that she just caught for you. So I forgot to do that this last time. And so I left it out there. So, oh, good, you know, good Dixie Ann. Good kitty, your top shelf, number one, you know, whatever. And there's just blood everywhere. This is just a brutal killing. And so the cat uh, killed the rat. And then, uh, and then so it was left there for a little while. Well, uh, we got busy, and then I opened the door for the desert to show that the rat uh, was outside and that the Dixie Ann, is the name of the cat, had caught uh, this rat. And so all of a sudden, the rat's gone. You know, I'm like, what happened to the rat? I know it was dead. So then Dixie Ann, I turn my head as she's about four feet away. Uh, she is like, has a wild uh, look in her eye, and she's inhaling uh, the rat. So she got it down. So all I could see was uh, the tail and a foot hanging out of her mouth. She had choked down uh, all the fur, 
all of the hair, all the nose, the whiskers, uh, feet, except for one and a tail. And then, uh, so she she cut off one of the, the one of the, she cut off the tail and gulped down the last uh, foot. And then, uh, right, this is great stuff. And then uh, the tail was there. And then uh, the deserts finally, you know, zeroing in and and uh, um, focusing in on what's going on. She's like, oh my gosh, you know. And then at that, at that the cat didn't miss, miss a beat. You know, whoop, the tongue went down and grabbed that tail and down it went. It does waste not, want not. So the rats in Sacramento are tasty. I'm telling you, this cat is eternally hungry. Now the desert thinks she may have worms, but I think she's just cold. It's winter. Uh, I don't think she's got worms, but there again, uh, she probably knows more than I do. But this cat is uh, is incredible, agile like you cannot believe. Uh, she gets through little gaps. She climbs walls. Uh, you name it, and and then she's this is like the best dog you'll ever have. She goes with you out to to get the parts. She'll stay out there the whole time, uh, circling, making sure there's nothing that's going to harm you while you're working. She'll sit there and watch you, just like a dog does. They'll stare at you. Uh, and then when it's uh, time to go back, get other tools, whatever, bam, with you the whole time. Uh, gets up to the front of the door. You know, If she could open it, she would. And then bam, right back out to the uh, job site. Wow. A just amazing cat. This is the... I've had some good cats, uh, a couple. I'm telling you, this is like the most incredible cat and very... Uh, kind and um is a talker but uh just right by your side the whole time and uh very friendly to the customers she helps the customers shop uh, but if i walk out she's gonna come to me first and then uh but she's uh the customers always give uh, good reviews uh good a, a good um you know customer assistance customer support customer service uh you know dixie ann they're probably getting better um, marks than we are. I'm telling you. No attitude, nothing. Bam. Right there. This is just incredible. I, I, I definitely appreciate uh, Dixie Ann. So she's a great cat. I'll get some pictures of her and I'll get the one with the tail going down. That's all I was left. That's how fast she ate that rat. I just can't believe it. And she's not a big cat. She's a petite cat. So, uh, bus is goodness. Uh, as on good. Thanks, bus, for being here. I know we're starting late again. I know everyone hates that, but anyway, we have some good stuff tonight, and I appreciate you being here. Everyone who may uh, be on, I think there's one f person who follows us on Twitch. So thank you so much if you're following on Twitch. I do appreciate that. Uh, but um, everyone else, I think, has been signed off until Jamie gets us up to speed on Rumble. Uh, Facebook, uh, BitChute, uh, you know, um, all the other ones, uh, Twitch and uh, X and, and what have you, because I think we uh, cut it all off uh, for a moment. Uh, it just wasn't going through. It was a big ordeal. So uh, he's figuring out a way for it to digitally or electronically be where I pay like $9 a month. And it goes to all the platforms. It used to be a lot more. So I believe the price has come down. So YouTube gives you a, uh, sorry, restream. There's a lot of players here, right? So the, the you have a computer in that for me. And then you have uh, um, a, uh, a, a streaming service. So the way I use restream. There's restream uh, comes and picks up the OSB, which is the actual program. Uh, that allows me to uh, analyze and bring the picture to Restream, right? So I have OSB, then Restream. And then it goes to YouTube and Twitch. You can get two free. Uh, and then after that, uh, one has to pay on Restream to uh, emanate out, duplicate, whatever you want to call it. And then I am able to uh, get multi-platform. So that's what I'm looking for. Now, I gave Jamie a little check, so I hope he's happy, and perhaps he can get us linked accordingly. Because it's not too far away that I will hopefully be doing the uh, the, the big show, recording that big show f with uh, the female co-host. And then uh, that's going down to David in Los Angeles, who will edit everything up. 
So I don't want to get long-winded on that again, but uh, that's in the works, and hopefully that comes through. Okay, so tonight, let's uh, watch uh, an interesting uh, lineup by God for us. This is going to go back a little bit to um, uh, kind of reflect and and give some uh, acknowledgement and, and good feelings and, and remembrance and... Uh, you know, we sure miss uh, all about John. So I included a few videos of him tonight. And this first one here is an interesting story of someone who's extremely successful in this country uh, and uh, did some hard work and, and made it. And I like that. He didn't have anyone, uh, you know, give him millions of dollars. As a man, sorry, uh, there's great women too. I'll put them on the show. I love that. But this just happens to be a man. It happens to be because we were parked next to a truck and the truck has a sign on the side which identifies exactly who that person was. Uh, is, and uh, we, uh, it was a good story, so I wanted to include it. So this is where I'm bringing John into work as I used to, uh, or the general would. And then we would, um, you know, go down the road and um, I'd usually try to film as I went. And the general didn't film him at all. It didn't get any good content, but I did. I was like, every time we're going down, we're going to get uh, something. And this is kind of neat. Uh, John is extremely uh, well. Um, uh, he has uh, great knowledge. And uh, he observes. And he is interested in uh, learning. And so he knew about certain people. Not just because of what was written about them. He actually, uh, I believe, met this person. And he was actually... Um, in the uh, same location at a certain time of his life where this person was. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so let's get on with this one here. And Crypto. Hey, Crypto. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. So, uh, yeah, you just uh, missed the rat story, but that's okay. You can catch that on the if you uh, tune in uh, or go to the beginning again. Cat caught a rat and ate it. It's pretty amazing. Uh, in incredible stuff. Uh, but isn't that what they're supposed to do, right? Uh, anyway, so let's do this one here. And again, this is uh, John before he passed. And it was really nice being able to... Uh, I have tons of footage, uh, hours of this. So it's nice to once in a while go back and, and see that. So it was just uh, last year, not even quite a year ago. And we saw this uh, uh, little bit and I wanted to put it together. So here we are. Blockbuster video, yeah, and sold it when it was at the height of it. Yeah, remember? I got two million dollars out of for the homeless shelter. Oh, that's nice. Down in Florida, right? Yeah. Got another five hundred thousand from his son. Okay, coming back. Now, I want to add something to this. So that it was a little fast. And what I'm going to do now is enhance that and give you some foundation for it. So uh, Wayne Hizinga is a billionaire. And uh, as he, John was saying, uh, created waste, waste management. Let's go on to uh, this uh, web. Let's just go on to the Internet. And I'll show you some inf information here that I think is pretty fascinating. So this here is a, um, a page, right? Not a big deal. Uh, H. Wayne Huizinga. Now this is 2018. He was worth almost three billion. I'm probably more now, uh, most likely. And so I wanted to just to go down through some facts here because I like persons who uh, people who can make things happen uh, with with little or nothing and and start from the bottom. I I, I love that this kid is uh, hit it big in several industries, starting with garbage collection, right? Who wouldn't want to start at the bottom with garbage collection with everyone else thinks it's just garbage? I love it. Uh, at age 
at age 25, right, Hazinga started a waste pickup service and within five years had consolidated 100 other pickup companies into giant waste management. Uh, go figure, right? After taking waste management public in 1971, so right, he's out there working hard in the 60s, uh, he, ex he, brought, he bought and expanded Blockbuster Video before selling it to Viacom for $8.4 billion in 1994. Good time to get out because as we know, Blockbuster went down, but uh, way to go and capitalize on that. Uh, super. Uh, he also created waste disposal firm, uh, Republic Services, lodging firm, extended stay. Well, we, we know we've seen a lot of extended stay and auto nation. We've seen that too. Talk about hitting home runs on a lot of those. Uh, it's amazing. In 2015, Hazinga uh, sold the U.S. operations of Swisher, right? Service uh, to clean bathrooms and restaurants to Ecolab, which you see now uh, many times for $40 million. Another uh, Kazinga move. That's awesome. Uh, let's look at this here. Personal stats. Source of wealth investments and self-made. Excellent. Like that. And then what do we have here? Uh, citizenship, yes. Children, four. Dropout from Calvin College. Excellent. Uh, I got to start with $5,000 he borrowed uh, from his father to buy a single garbage truck. And if you were listening to John, it uh, basically says, uh, he said, which is true, uh, Zinga would drive the truck and then the brother, our brother-in-law was able to... Uh, a dump the trash in the back. And in 1971, uh, as you probably would know, um, garbage collection was, uh, at least where I worked, uh, sorry, I didn't work in 1971, when I was a little tiny kid running around, uh, those were guys that hung on to the back of uh, trucks, garbage trucks down the road and everything. They just hung on. And when the truck stopped, they jump off and they would grab your garbage can and smash the crap out of it along the side because you would overstuff it. And then it would all get dumped into the thing, right? And so after about, oh, I don't know, you know, six months, two years of that, your garbage can was completely beat the shit out of uh, the, the edges because they would hit the edge and hit the rim, you know, and that would pull the, the, the crap out and go into the garbage. I mean, those garbage cans had to be tough. If you bought the cheap ones, eh, and not too many plastic ones were available back in 1971. At least that I remember. They're all metal cans. So it was a very loud and noisy thing. You just hear the smash, smash. It was great. Our driveway was, oh my gosh, our driveway was so long. And it was steep hill. We lived on the top of this hill, and you'd have to and try to feel how strong you were by there's three garbage cans so one arm would carry two cans right and the other arm would carry one can as you as you haul it and i was a little kid I, I couldn't handle it i would just i'd carry the lids right my brothers would have to carry the garbage cans and, but anyway good for him right to uh become a billionaire and being smart and work hard and take an opportunity uh or made an opportunity probably it came his way uh, that he made happen right he got a gar he bought uh, a garbage truck with five thousand dollars and 71 it's a pretty good amount of money uh to buy a garbage truck and start and had a root and whatever i salute that that is awesome that is so awesome god I love that i just i just love it i wish i could get there and i gotta try harder i really do but good for him right not a bunch of nonsense people do nowadays. It's just good industrial work. Man, I love it. So that's the uh, first one there. And that's giving some uh, respect to John, uh, who just is so knowledgeable and who would know so many people and done so many things. As a matter of fact, we have another video of him tonight uh, being related to more uh, incredible things here in the, in the U.S. And so uh, John is uh, more of a... I mean, he's a super talented guy, absolutely smart as as anything, but uh, not really money driven, but definitely uh, knowledge driven. I love to help people, and he did. And so I I appreciate the stories he would uh, ref, uh, you know enlighten me to uh, with. So that was pretty good. This one here, this next one is called. Uh, there's no name to it really, uh, but this is how 
uh, one little aspect of fifth wheel hookups go. And I think it's important uh, once in a while to share uh, the differences between trailers and fifth wheels, uh, travel trailers and fifth wheels, or pull behinds or bumper pulls. There's a, a lot of names for what's called for the most common type of trailer there is. Right, all of, of all RVs, 50% are actually a travel trailers. Now there's a different, there's a, lot, a host of names for a travel trailer. So again, an RV includes many different types of, uh, of trailers and motorhomes, but the, the most popular is called the travel trailer. They also called a bumper pole or a, you know pole behind. These are, again, different names for the same thing. This video here focuses on a fifth wheel. Now a fifth wheel utilizes a hitch in the back of your truck, not off the, the bumper, right? Of course, you wouldn't want to pull a trailer off your bumper anyway. It's just an expression. That's the area which it attaches. It actually attaches to your frame through some sort of hitch extension receiver is what it's called. But to make it simple, uh, you either attach to the back of the truck near the bumper, or you attach to a fifth wheel uh, that is uh, in the middle of uh, the your bed of the truck, ideally over the axle. There's yet another one too, and that's called a cab over, which we'll look at tonight as well. And that fits into the entirety of the bed of the truck and actually hangs over the front. That's why it's called cab over. And those are called a truck camper also. And that's another way of uh, uh, carrying around a trailer. So there's three different ways a truck can carry a camper uh, or uh, a trailer. Let's just say RV because that is the right use of the term and that is uh, what they are, RVs. Okay, so someone uh, gave me the uh, on the ice phone so I have to make sure I check that in case there's emergency. Okay. No emergency. It must be my volume is going. I can't believe it. So let's look at this fifth wheel hookup. I'm going to... It's just one little... A uh, small scope, a uh, view. Uh, I can't use those words together, but a little view of of the hookup. There's uh, there's many angles. There's different steps to a hookup, and we can review that. But I wanted to zero in on one a uh, part of the hookup, and then we can explain a little bit of that. But I think it's good to know as you go down, say you know nothing about fifth wheels, but you occasionally see them and then you go, oh, you know, that one's connected to the back, uh, inside the back of the, the, inside the bed of the truck. Oh, that one's connected to the back of the truck. Why is there a difference and how does that all work? If you are interested, I'll try to keep it fun and we'll go through how this works. Okay, so this will be kind of neat. All right, here we go. Now I'm going to stop it occasionally so that we can discuss some some things that are going on. Okay, so I'm driving and Mick is, like Mick Jagger, Mick is going to line me up on the... Uh, the hitch here that we have. Now you see that crossbar that goes from one side of the bed to the other. That's that silver thing with um, uh, with the, the with the uh, plate that comes down with two those two uh, uh, fingers that kind of come down there to kind of uh, ease uh, the sliding onto the um, the kingpin collar, which is going to come through off of the. The, the part there from the top of the trailer, you can see it hanging down. It has a collar that comes down. That's called your kingpin. And that goes on to the receiving plate there on top of the hitch, right? And then sometimes you would have some sort of greased uh, plate, uh, grease on there if it was thousands of pounds, so which this is, but not like a semi-truck. Or you'd have what's called a Teflon plate which we carry, and that makes it easier to twist when you go around turns. Okay, so you're going to see us align. You're going to see us align or line up uh, for the collar to go into the slot, which is uh, right there in the middle of that uh, hitch uh, uh, 
that uh, that it's leading into there that that slot and then there's a locking mechanism that has to be engaged so that the collar will not come back out should you take off because that has to go in but then it needs to be locked behind and we'll <clears throat> look at this so a couple things first is What's interesting is uh, I run old school, so I'll, we do have a camera, but I don't like to use it because I always like to make sure that it's fun, get the guys out there, uh, and so we line it up manually. Now, of course, the camera can work to, if I was by myself, I would use the camera, but since I'm not by myself and I have Mick, we don't use the camera, and we go ahead and use, uh, he lines this up. So when I'm not using the camera, I may be off by just a couple degrees or a couple inches, and it's not good. If you're off by more than, uh, say, an inch and a half, you're going to put a lot of pressure on the hitch as it slides into that slot. That slot has a V um, uh, opening, and so one can kind of fudge, and it will work its way in the V. But when you do that, you put pressure on everything, and it's, it's not ideal to put a lot of pressure on, on anything. It should go in there very easily lined up. So you'll kind of see how that works. He doesn't want to do that either. And so he has me go back and forth here a couple times till we get it right. So I'll let this play out to a little bit here. Those are just my brakes you hear. Okay, so I gotta go out and come back in. Okay, so you, you see right there, you see right there, there's a gap of light between the bottom plate uh, above the, the kingpin collar and the, um, the top of the hitch. You see that little gap. Well, you really don't want to see that gap. And that's the reason why you saw Nick uh, struggle with the latch on the, for the lock. It's not going to engage because the whole trailer is too high. Yeah, he's going to need to lower it, and that's what he's going to do here. That collar has to be just in the right position for the finger to come around the collar. The bottom of the collar has a lip. You can kind of see it. It's barely in white at the, at the bottom of that gap. That's a, a big lip around the bottom of the collar. Well, the, the lock goes above that lip, and right now it's jammed, and it can't get around it because that lip is in the way. So what he's going to do is lower it, and then that you'll see it uh, go uh, go into position. Come back. Just a little bit back. All right. 
Okay, so you heard that big kalunk, right? That was the, uh, th that's the, the lock that you see it right there one more time. So, you can see, so you're going to be looking right at the bottom of that gap where the collar is and then you'll see it slap right on through. It happens very fast, really. There it is. Okay, so that's uh, that's it there. So a couple of things regarding um, regarding fifth wheel hookups. So the bumper pull is a bit easier, right? Now with modern technology, you can uh, ladies, men, everyone in between can uh, hook up uh, their fifth wheel by themselves. Not a problem. The reason I usually have someone with us is because we're having to. We're not just hooking up some fifth wheel we always have to prep it these these units usually need help uh tires uh, have problems they need to be uh, strapped down there's stuff falling off of them uh they have been there for a while so you're gonna want probably one or two people to make sure this all happens and then we usually travel quite a ways and that unit was huge and in case something starts to get a little crazy it's nice to have another person there to you know stuff falls off it, you know whatever it's just good to have a safety person. Going with the, the raspberry water again. Man, it's good. So, what the, uh, the fifth wheel also is very stable. The more you put that weight or some weight of the uh, trailer uh, closer in, instead of pivoting off of the back of the truck... You can see how there's this flexing and torsion and twisting that can occur, right? That's why it's a ball, so that it can do that uh, on the back of these hitches uh, that when it comes off a bumper pull or a, a travel drive. And it can kind of rotate a little bit. You don't want too much of it. And then they make what's called uh, a weight distribution bars that will lock in and prevent a lot of that from happening. When it gets too uh, windy, when it gets icy, when you slam on the brakes too fast, uh, those types of trailers have a tendency to, uh, if you're on any angle at all, they'll go sideways, and it's called what, what's called a jackknife. That becomes extremely dangerous, and it can rip you off the road. It most likely will rip off of the hitch, and the uh, even though, well, if you have safety, large safety chains on, it's going to take you with it. It most likely will take you with it. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a problem. With the fifth wheel, it's safer until it's not safer. So just kind of going through these because this stuff happens and you can look it up online, accidents with fifth wheel trailers and travel trailers and what happens when they start flipping over and getting out of control. So that fifth wheel most likely is a little safer until it's not and then it will take you over uh, most of the time when it starts to flip and something happens uh, the fifth wheel can jackknife as well it can do all those things it can jackknife and uh, that collar that's stuck in there with a nice sturdy hitch that's bolted to your frame is gonna pull you over if it starts to roll it will take the whole truck and everything uh, sometimes they break off and sometimes they'll just spin around and everyone will spin around and stay upright which is good so I've been, uh, I think the best uh, example of a trailer was uh, I was going through Mojave and Mojave can have extreme uh, wind. Uh, hold on, I'll get you. Mojave can have extreme wind uh, activity or whatever it's called. Uh, the uh, PK would give me the right word for that. But when it uh, gets really windy out there, and I'm telling you, it gets windy. Uh, Palm Springs, Salt and Sea area, the gap there, uh, Mojave, these gaps that, uh, that are funneling air, it's just, it's incredible. So uh, you get these trailers, you don't slow down and the wind starts coming what's called a crosswind, you're going to have big problems. And then uh, it, also if you were to hit uh, your brakes at any time, uh, trying to avoid something, that's going to just initiate a, uh, a problem with a trailer that you're pulling and what happens is that trailer wants to keep going straight right even though the truck is turning or uh, the wind is blowing so hard over the truck not a big deal but when you have a sail behind you like a trailer 
it's just gonna you know it's gonna tip possibly and so you have to slow down when you're in traffic and you have to slow down when there's crosswinds or wind in general if you don't then you have these problems that occur and so I came up on this trailer that was flipped and it had taken the truck completely over as well right in the middle of the freeway just flipped them all over and uh, it seemed like everyone was okay but it's just uh, you, you know you're sitting there just going man you know you got to slow down whomever was driving because uh, you're gonna kill someone else you're gonna kill yourself and, and what have you so uh, we toot along, uh, go down the road, but I try to make sure that uh, whomever is driving uh, the trucks here uh, knows, and they know, they're good, everyone's here is a pretty good driver, uh, to uh, when you get in traffic, we're in slow lane. And when we are uh, in wind, we are in uh, the slow lane. And uh, there are definitely times when we're in snow and uh, once in a while, but rain um, very frequently. And you got to go slow too. But that fifth wheel uh, smooths it out. It gives you a very good ride, and it's uh, and more stable. However, uh, it is also a uh, it's a, it's a little bit of a scare when those things start to go over, and they all will at some point. Uh, you just have to be uh, ready and not let them uh, do that. And that's by being uh, a good driver and having things. Uh, in place and uh, checked. You want to check things, make sure that lock, like we just saw, was engaged so that the collar does not back out, right? Uh, you're, everything's resting on that, so that has to happen. All right, so we've got through, we have, we have <coughs> made our way through, excuse me, uh, we made our way through the waste management story with uh, Wayne Hazinga, is that great? Uh, fifth wheel hookups. Now we're going to be uh, checking out a uh, fun story. This is with John, uh, yet again, experiencing uh, a time of his life, and he shared it with us, and I think it's pretty neat. I wanted to share it with you. Okay, here we go. What a joke. For like a week. Really. Can you imagine us in charge of the space shuttle? Or nowadays, uh, whatever. The Falcon X. Can you imagine us? Yeah. There'd be nothing going wrong. Well, if you were in charge. Yeah. <laughs> if you were in charge, it'd be a, a, a smooth sailing uh, uh, mission. But can you imagine the rest of us? Did I ever tell you about the... Surveying astronaut and space program. You entered it. I did. And? I was on the way list to do it. And then that Sally ride went up and the first one that blew up, they canceled the program. They canceled it. Yeah. And then they canceled you. Yeah. But you would have been perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he had to pass an IQ test and a bunch of stuff, and I flew through all that. Yeah, you already know how to fly. Yeah. So, which helps. You did all the things to make it perfect. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, Christy McCullough, for whatever her name is, went up in there, and Christy something. Right. The teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I got blown up. And they canceled the program. So lucky you were, it wasn't you. you. Still would have gone. I still would have gone. You gone for a minute something up in space and blown up? Why not? Or okay. I still want to go after they blow up. Yeah. I told them I'm still wanting to go. And uh, they said no, we're canceling the program. Yeah, I would have been in the third trip. John, could you imagine? We wouldn't have known you then. Yeah. Well, the first trip blew up. Not after that. That's yeah, because they rushed through. Inspection. 
Jump out all ring. Right. But it froze one night down there in Florida. That's what they said. So yeah. it created a gap. It shrunk. But they usually don't bring those shuttles out of the hangar. Oh, you see the hangar they storm, and they are huge. You can get... Um, they store them vertical. Yeah. Russia doesn't do that. Only America wants to spend all the money, all the equipment, uh, elevators, and they don't do it. They, they lift it vertical when they get to the platform over there in Russia. They don't put them up. They don't go down the gantry. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they're in this building, and it's incredible. Huh? Hey, you look up, and whoa, is the ceiling stop somewhere up there? Man, just humongous. And it's but, storming outside. They're all working away. Yeah, and usually in the morning of liftoff, they'll roll out. It's a two-mile trip. And it goes takes like six hours. It goes like a quarter mile an hour. So yeah. It's slow. Uh-huh. It's pretty awesome looking the track goes down, huh? Or the machine that takes it down. Yeah, that track layer. Ooh, man. I think that's some gears, huh? Yeah. But, uh... uh you should I have never, been on it, John. I never got to see um, a shell to go up. But I got to tour the um, place and then just put you in awe. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm back. I want to. Uh, that's awesome, right? Uh, that uh, he, you know, he's saying he was in the 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 uh, program for uh, selection of uh, uh, teachers and um, other uh, professionals in the industries, different industries to uh, to fly on the shuttle. The shuttle program was gung ho uh, right until that happened. Uh, and then it started to get that uh, a series of setbacks because of it. So they had slated. Um, they wanted like 400, I think it was. Uh, whew, I'm probably off on this. I should not. I should better quote myself. But um, it was. They wanted to do uh, just an. NASA wanted to do an incredible amount, have an, a, a large amount of shuttle lifts, offs, uh, and missions uh, each year. Uh, that was slated for quite a few, and um, it wanted to. They ramp it up. To the point where they had a launch facility uh, created over in Vandenberg Air Force Base. I was able to go out there uh, a long time ago um, when I was a lot younger, when I was in um, climatology and meteorology. So I had a job when I was uh, younger uh, flying, taking air temperatures for the California Air Resources Board. And I would have to go up early in the morning and collect, uh, we had instruments, and I would collect uh, uh, air temperatures, uh, different uh, heights of the uh, different uh, altitudes, or, you know, heights uh, of the atmosphere. And then we would submit that data uh, to Air Resources Board. Every day, there are what's called soundings, uh, temperature measurement uh, uh, being, uh, analyze excuse, excuse me so you have soundings uh, you have uh, measurements being taken uh, and that comes from a uh, balloon launches mostly right uh, from aircraft uh, now they probably even use drones I guess maybe now but before drones came out we had to do it uh, through air for through aircraft and then we would uh, circle up and my area was uh, Central Valley of California and just go up 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 and then um, take our uh, measurements uh, Depending upon what the uh, if someone had called out sick, you'd have to take measurements over uh, uh, the south area, right? In the Sam uh, Bakersfield, you'd take measurements over Fresno, take measurements over uh, Stockton, Sacramento. They, they would have a series of, of measurements taken, so they have uh, that's important to know, and they infer information from that. 
Well, in Fresno is where I was. Uh, we had the, um, I would do the air measure, the air temperature at the same exact time that the flight would take off and conduct these uh, air measure uh, temperatures. This is the craziest thing. Uh, I would take off and the runway at, at uh, Fresno was uh, generally aligned with the university, uh, which was up uh, a few miles ahead, right? If you were to go straight and then uh, what we would do is make our turn to the right. And as I make the turn to the right, that would uh, start to circle up and then you'd shoot out at uh, whatever uh, feet was, uh, was required for the day. And it was uh, quite fascinating because this happened many times if you took off at the exact right time, uh, the sounding for the balloon uh, <clears throat> was um, what they were measuring from the university did soundings, not temperature, but wind. OK, so they were measuring wind and this uh, balloon had a little uh, sensor thing on it would it beam back a signal of location to uh, the receiver down at the university. And we would do that. Uh, sorry, they would do that. Uh, and so this balloon would go up, right? And it has a little box on it. every day. It'd be like, man, that's a lot of money lost. But that's what happened. But that's how important these soundings were. Uh, so I would be taking off, whatever. And, and so this would, I had no idea that the, that the wind was being monitored by the balloon aloft from the university. Okay, all this is going on, but I, I wasn't in the whole uh, picture. Now, there's different agencies that would use this information. Air Resources Board is one for California. That's going to be monitoring pollution, things like that. The military also uses it. And uh, there's a, a number of uh, departments, state and federal, that use that. So i uh, taken off, right? This is going on. I had that job for um, a couple of years. And so <clears throat> I would take off. One time, the first time, uh, it's dark, so we would take, I'd take off at, uh, at like 4.50 or 5 a.m. That's when, so most of the time it was already, it was dark, right? Half of the year it was dark. And i take off and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the light would still be on. My light would still be on, headlight would still be on. I'm in a smaller plane, whatever, and I'm going along and all of a sudden, I am not scared the bejeeminis out of me. It looked like a giant, Casper ghost, right? It's this giant white ball that just comes right up in front of the air, airplane. I I thought the propeller was going to chop it in half, and so it just it's just this big thing and ooh like that. And actually, I'm going faster than it, so it was going up and I'm going up, and it, and it just kind of goes off to the side as I go right over it, I think. And I'm like WTF? They didn't have WTF back then, but I, I said the other words to it, right? I was like, what the heck is that? So I, I, you know, I was busy the rest of the day and it took me a week or so. I asked this, what the heck was that? And then and, and I never got an answer. So this happened again. And I was like, you know, a giant balloon is just coming up underneath the aircraft. And I'm not kidding. This happened again. At that point, I was like, okay, I'm finding out what the heck this is. At the time I was doing graduate work at the university and, and, and uh, take, uh, taking a few classes. Uh, that uh, were related to weather. Okay, I was in climatology, but I was taking a, a meteorology class as well. And I so I asked my instructor, I said, are they doing, is, is there some sort of, you know, uh, a balloon launch here that, that I'm not aware of that's going on? And uh, the instructor says, yeah, you know, every day, Bill, just so happens, uh, does a launch. And... I, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I got to go, you know, find out about that. So when I had, and he'd been doing it for years, like 20 years, it's just crazy. When I uh, was finally able to uh, kind of uh, light my load, I went and talked to Bill and uh, said, did you ever see uh, the, your balloon like almost get knocked out of the sky, you know? And he was not a one for laughing at all. He is extremely uh, serious and dry a sense of uh, there's no humor, no humor, and uh, he may have had a grunt or something like that. I go, well, it was me, you know, I, and I almost uh, destroyed your balloon a couple of times. But um, I said, well, now I want to learn how to do that. 
And so I did. So he's like, okay, you know, be here at 4.55 in the morning. And it's like, well, I'm already familiar with that, so not a problem. I didn't fly every day. Uh, the, the guy who owned the airplane would get his times in, too. We would do it to uh, uh, keep current, build hours, uh, get a little pay. It was fine. Uh, it was always beautiful in the morning because the air is very still. And so you would not have to uh, really worry about any weather unless it was in the middle of winter, and then uh, you're going to have some problems. Uh, we had that too, and you wouldn't go up uh, when it was deathly, uh, you know, stormy. Just not going to happen. I will share one time with you uh, as the most amazing a flight I think I've ever been in, even in commercial aircraft uh, at jet, you know, at altitude. But this one was, uh, it was somewhere, uh, you know, eight, nine thousand feet, I think, somewhere around there. And it was an early morning. <clears throat> I was uh, shooting. We both were together that time. It was amazing. Uh, the the owner of the plane and myself. And we were going up to Sacramento from Fresno to get temps and then come back. We went into what just so, ha it wasn't a cell. It wasn't a hollowed out cell, but there was a number of clouds that created this entire kind of like um, auditorium. It was a giant um, opening inside this cloud or clouds. And they came together uh, for a period of time to create this incredible, it was, it was purple inside and it was there was clouds inside this gigantic cavern and it was huge uh, so we were talking you know maybe like 10 miles long and a few miles wide or whatever and we're, we're traveling through it and it was just this big like it's inside of a, a, a balloon and you would see these black things which were actually little clouds inside little orbs uh, floating around inside it almost looked like something that was uh, biological right like you're inside some sort of bloodstream as just uh, as incredible and uh, we just we came into it and it just you know it opens up and you're in the deepest purple color uh, blue purple and then these uh, these little black things that were coming by us is like I, luckily you're like okay I'm familiar with weather I know clouds I study it and it's like okay this is a pretty neat experience but totally different than what I've ever seen so we turned on the light turn off the light and you could just see it illuminate inside and then go go dark again and those were just rays uh, beginning to crest over the Earth's uh, surface at altitude. So remember when the rays come up uh, that you see, uh, the reason they're red is because they're going through a lot of atmosphere. And it's a longer wave wavelength, so it slows down, right? It's, so that's what keeps the color down at a deep red and all. Purple, of course, is real high but uh, frequency, but in this case, you'll see the atmosphere is it always changes from like black through purple to blue and all that. Uh, but at any rate, it wasn't the end of the day, nor was it uh, when the sun actually came out. It was very, very uh, high atmosphere. So it was just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I was really excited to have that opportunity. But back to uh, John here, that was really cool that he was uh, able to uh, be part of that program if he wasn't and it was an uh, amazing thing. And uh, too bad it didn't uh, pan out for him. Uh, but he is a big fan of flight and uh, airspeed and uh, car speed and all that. And I wanted to kind of let everyone share that experience of him. Uh, just, uh, you know, letting us know about how his, what things happened in his life. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay, so we got the desert here. Thank you so much. And Bus and PK, awesome. Thank you guys for being here. And Crypto, thank you. Okay, this next one is... Um, it's kind of neat because, uh, again, we're going back to a, uh, a trailer. This one's called a Cab Over. Now, Cab Overs are those that are also known as truck campers, and they fit into the back of the bed of the truck, right? And then they, they kind of launch and, and curve over the front. Uh, that's really easy. We all know that. That's... Um, that's a, uh, that's called a cab over. So the cab over on this one that we see here is pretty neat. Um, it is attached to, usually you have the bed of your truck. This one's attached to, there is no bed. It's a utility, which we have, it's a utility box or utility bed. The utility bed has these risers that come up on each side, which are your toolbox, right? 
And then there's a slot down the middle that you would put tools or whatever. Well, this person put a cab over inside the slot and it's pretty neat. Now there's another thing which is nice about this cab over is it's short. Uh, the, most of them go off the bed and they, they come down and they incorporate in that space bathrooms or a restroom. The ones that are short usually have no restroom at all. It's a very small apparatus. You have your stove, a little place to eat, which is uh, it folds into a bed, and then that's about it. You have the refrigerator, uh, a couple of steps up to the loft, and, and that's <clears throat> that's what happens in the, in the shorter ones. Those are <clears throat> flush with the back of your tailgate. So they fit right in. The extended ones, which are more numerous, uh, go off the back and they hang off, and that's why you would need a camper special or a 2,500, three-quarter ton, or one-ton truck. Truck. The short ones, you can get away with a half-ton truck. They will hold them. So I want to show you that uh, here, and we had an example. We'll talk through it, and let me get this going for you. Hang on. So we have a utility bed, we could just start hauling it like that. Yeah, it's good to know. It's the little one too. I got the exact same utility bed. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so I'm going to pause it right there. Sorry, I paused it at the beginning just to turn the volume on. So I'm going to go just a little... There. Okay, so he's got an, an actual strap. You can see a strap holding the whole thing uh, on, which is interesting because you don't see any... Um, tie downs if you notice there's no tie downs right and uh, you can't incorporate those so there's a strap holding it on i can see the strap it's a blue strap goes around around the, the red line there but isn't that cute so that's a utility bed on the back of the truck most likely that's a three-quarter ton truck uh and then the cab as you see the cab over uh it's it's uh, connected uh uh, to the back, to the truck, right, and then the, the front berth part goes over the the cab where you drive, and then the back of it is nice and snug, uh, right up to where the gate would come up. You see the door on the back of the cab over, right? That they all have that door is not a big deal, and then you would have some sort of either accordion step that comes down or a bucket or a you know a little ladder something like that that would uh, drop down. It's very cool. And so uh, that's a smaller unit. Uh, again, they don't make as many of those and uh, they're sought after. A lot of people like the smaller units uh, that fit into there. And this one fits into the back of that bed. So that bed is still eight feet long and that's the body of that uh, cab. That cab over is eight feet, fits right in. And then it's another four feet or so that goes uh, up and over the, the cab, four or five feet. So pretty cool, uh, a little lighter weight, so that way you could put it into a lighter duty truck, uh, but uh, in this case, you can kind of tell if you had a utility bed on the back of a truck, it would automatically be a uh, three quarter or one ton truck. They don't put those utilities on the back of a half ton truck, it just will kill them. So anyway, I thought that was kind of neat to be able to see how someone incorporated a cab over onto a utility. I had never seen that. It's not a surprise. It's just cool because I, I hadn't seen one, but it makes sense. Uh, so uh, usually sometimes uh, you would have those boxes uh, be able to lift up the utility bed box that, that, that it's riding upon. It's also riding upon the base as well. So it should just fit right in snugly, which it looks like it's extremely snug on the box section, which are the shoulders, and it looks like it's snug on the bottom. So you will not be able to lift up anything on top of the box. You'd only be able to open those side doors. And if you look closely, you can see the uh, there's side doors that open on those boxes. So it looks like they still have use of the box, the utility bed, and also uh, a place to stay. So I thought that was pretty cool to, to have that. A little bungee holding up the trim tab on the back. That's nice. I use a uh, bag got rubber racks on it. Wow. Uh, it's 
got that refrigeration insulated look for uh, Alaska. You could hear John there. He was in that one as well. That's pretty neat. So, okay. That was fun. Uh, again, so cab overs we talked about. Fifth wheels we talked about. And saw some examples of both of those. Uh, when I was a kid, cab overs were extremely popular. Uh, they, it was like, man, they were everywhere. And they're still very popular today, but not as much as I think they were in the older days. I could be wrong, but it just seems like uh, there's... There were more. I'm going to have to look that up and see what they... Remember how we looked on RVIA and checked out the manufacturing the other day on the show? We looked at how many were being made. I can actually break that down. RVA does the same for travel trailer, fifth wheel, motorhome. It'll give you uh, the breakdown of, of each of the RVs. So I have to look that up and see where we're at on that. I would be... Uh, I should know that. And I apologize. I don't know that yet. So now we're up to... Uh, I have my last one right now. Are you ready? This is called, uh, well, I call it the piercing, but it's uh, <laughs> it's just a tree branch that had pierced uh, a trailer. Now, I have other content of this, and I just happened to come upon this uh, couple of video clips that was on this uh, disc that I'm using or chip. At times, I had two, two cameras going, so the chips, so I would switch the camera out accidentally, and so some of the video would be on another camera, and if I don't have it with me, and all of these videos are not uh, chronologically low, or, uh, you know, tracked, whatever, uh, uploaded, uh, inventoried, thank you, then I will miss out. Now, I've seen the other videos, and I'm sorry I don't have it, the other videos will have actual interior viewing of the uh, where the branch came through this RV. And it also, I have other um, material edit, uh, video of where the tree fell from. This was a large tree. Uh, I believe it was a large tree. Uh, cypress or a large fir tree and it was over in west sacramento the tree was um is during the winter and a lot of rain had occurred and then the wind came up afterwards and shoved it over so it went from across the street uh property it, it came and cut all the power lines in half when it came down and went across the street into a, into a trailer park. And fortunately, it went right along the back of the trailer park boundary to a residential boundary. And it went in between the houses and where the trailers are. Very fortunate. If, it, if the whole park was backed up or it was about six feet more to one, uh, the left, let's just say, it would have crushed like four RVs. And people were, and there are people in all of them. So it just so happened that it didn't, and it went to the back of this trailer by about a foot, is how close it got. But the problem is, uh, you, and you'll see up there, it had large branches. Fir trees have big branches, at least, you know, that big around. And those branches are whatever, 40 feet up to start. Well, the tree is like 100 feet away. So as it's falling and crashing and crushing, these branches are having to uh, get caught up in everyone's uh, business as they fall down too. So the branches that are sticking up is not a problem. The branches that are sticking out and now are pointed down from 60 feet up or so are going to penetrate or be crumbled depending upon what they hit and they penetrated right into this lady's roof so the lady is reading a book she is on a couch at the back of her trailer and the back of her trailer is where all the action is going to happen and so uh from mick who actually picked up this unit and uh, was able to speak with the lady who was inside it. Asked her, you know, well, so what happened? And so uh, you'll kind of hear the story here 
of, of what happened. So I'll let you hear it. All we are getting right now is the uh, visual from above. Uh, but again, I'll put together a larger video, a longer video, which is really good. It will have the, the setup, which is uh, the park, where it happened, the tree, where it came from, and then a walkthrough in the middle. But that will be at a later time. So let's watch this here right now. Okay, you guys are. You better go get a ladder, actually. No, I've been up this one before. Yeah? Uh huh. Can I hold it? Yeah, I, I went up it. Tell me. For a, a bit. Yeah, you good? Yep. Okay. I know, it's a little sketchy, but it, <laughs> it held. Isn't that crazy? I think we'll be alright. You just have the puncture? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a. Just a little uh, fatigue right there from the stretch. That's all okay. Okay, I am on the top of the world. I'm on the top of the big sky. This is the one where the lady uh, almost was killed, uh, where the tree came down, smashed across here, and a couple of the branches penetrated through. One penetrated through real close to her and went all the way to the floor. Uh, and she was able to miss uh, where it was. She went under a table, as Mick said, and uh, the branch went uh, a foot or so away from her and pierced uh, like a big uh, lightning bolt right through into the floor. So I bet I could eat bomb this. Just... I think the tape will be fine. I got right at the front cash register. She could give us a roll and some uh, some um, scissors. I'm going to yeah. seal up the roof. So right now, I'm <coughs> and now <coughs> checking out. Oh. You see that? If you notice, the roof is filled with uh, the sawdust from the tree that came through. So, this is where the branch is punctured right through. You can see the branch get right into it. Oh, it looks like a pine tree. Those look like pine needles. I'm sorry, I, th I thought it was a fir tree. It's a pine. What I'm trying to do is preserve uh, what's left of the roof because it's going to rain again more. You see the branch went, pierced it like a needle. So, uh, that's fine. Whatever debris on the inside is, is fine. A what? No. These branches totally punctured it. And then, lucky that lady wasn't impaled by a branch that went right. <laughs> Apparently, she was pretty close. Right? Yeah. Did she hear? It went right next to her. Right next. She heard it crack. Yeah, she, heard, she heard it coming. She heard it coming. She jumped down on the top of the cable. Right here. And the freaking right thing the just went like, ah! yeah. <laughs> like that. Did she freaking freak out? She's on the phone with her daughter or somebody. And, and uh, she's looking sideways and a giant branch comes right next to her head. <laughs> fucking right through, through the roof. Through the roof and all the way to the floor. Right. And, and it, 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 it breaks off all the little branches. It looks like a freaking needle coming right through. Yeah. It, it, looked like a, it looked like a giant bullet came through the whole thing. So how do you stand up and just cut you right in the house? That branch would have just oh, yeah, it would've, it would've speared her. Speared her from top to bottom. Like, a, like you're on a spit. Like if, if, she, if, she had, if she'd been anywhere else besides, if she'd been just sitting in one of the chairs on the couch, she would have been fine. Anywhere else besides under that coffee table, she would have been done. Because the branch just came through. Like, 
Right and now. did it did it stop like right above her head or something? I, I think it, it stopped when it hit the floor. Like the, the floor. It went all the way to the floor. Yeah, it went all the way to the floor. Holy shit! So, yeah. it, if you were in that area, it would have pierced yeah, you. Yeah, it would have done. That was that was no fun. Wow, man, is that awesome? That's crazy. Really man, we gotta get that on tape. All right, coming back. Coming back. Uh oh. Okay. So the the next video will be good on that because they do a walk through and you can see where the 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 whole thing uh, the branch went and then there's a uh, kind of so it's a pine tree obviously, and then uh, where it came across the street. That was an amazing thing. Uh, yeah, just it's always uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know it's always new. Sometimes not. You know, we get a lot of the same things. Oh, can you pick up a a trailer from you know uh, that's been on the property for twenty years, hasn't been moved, it's rotting away. We get that all the time. Uh, but then sometimes it's it's rather interesting. Uh, one uh, completely submerged under the river. We got one of those, um, and so you have to let the water all get out before you can take it. That one was scary. We called it the swamp buggy. I still need to do a video on that one. And we have other ones where uh, I catch on fire. We've had quite a few fire uh, units, uh, ones with uh, people have expired. And then we've had ones where people just generally expire. So uh, pick up the trailer, someone died. Um, yeah, uh, one uh, I didn't pick it up was uh, exploded. One uh, exploded which was the um, ammonia in the, the, uh, ref the refrigerator, right? So I don't know how this happened, but right. The guy had, I told you about this story a couple of times, and I think I've shown some pictures of it too. Uh, the motorhome, <clears throat> um, the, the person said, I want you to, t to take out the refrigerator and remove the refrigerator so the kid removes the gas line for the refrigerator somehow i don't know how that that happened because it should be an enclosed unit uh, but anyway it was leaking uh gas it was leaking ammonia gas and then the uh uh the the kid somehow wanted to test to see if the um, propane was working on the stove and that was uh, it wasn't necessarily the propane it was the ignition source when he went to light it and that's what gave him the combustion that they need ammonia is really fascinating because uh, it won't necessarily uh, catch fire if the uh, ratio is off yeah, like most things, right? You need so much air and so much mixture of uh, uh, liquid propane gas or ammonia, whatever it is, gasoline, right? If there's no air, it's not going to burn. But obviously, there's a lot of air around. But uh, ammonia is interesting. I think it's at 15% uh, concentration. So uh, should you have a confined space and it's at 15% or close to it, uh, then you'll have ignition uh, if there's a, uh, a gas just floating around. And the ammonia is a very strong smell. You'll know that smell. And you should not be uh, operating any type of uh, ignition source, uh, you know, things uh, when that's happening. Uh, neither should you be doing it when uh, uh, propane is, unless it's in a controlled space. And so uh, that explosion almost killed the sun. It literally blew him out of the door, uh, the front door. It blew him out of. It blew the wall out, <clears throat> and that uh, was fascinating because some of the stuff that was in the the rig went out of the gap of the entire wall, just blew out, and all this stuff is like stuck, uh, jammed in it. <clears throat> and then the front windshield blew out too. I was like, man, that's an experience. Plus, there was a fireball, and the poor kid uh, was burned severely and that's that's just a terrible thing <clears throat> so one needs to be very careful uh we've had 
nothing happened here, knock on wood, but uh, one of the guys that used to work with us, remember RJ, remember our, good old RJ? He did a, a crazy little stunt with some guy's rig uh, with his heater and uh, somehow didn't hook up the uh, propane source to it correctly. And when he went to, uh, the guy went to test it, uh, it, it, it caught fire. And then RJ went to put out the fire. He had just had the entire rig inside restored. He had just had his entire trailer restored. It was a vintage trailer. And RJ went in there and just nuked it with the flame throw or with the uh, flame retardant and opened up his wall, ripped open his wall to put the fire out. Uh, in some respects, it's like, well, you got to do that. But, oh, that was just a, it was a bad scene. Bad scene. I was like, RJ, you, you, you're just a, a walking tornado. <laughs> you know, and that's uh, RJ is the guy who uh, stole the trailer from that nice lady, the uh, motorhome. Sold it to some white trash, and then they eventually destroyed the whole unit. And we had that on one of our shows as well. That was just amazing. What a complete catastrophe. That guy there, you, you, anything related to RJ, you're going to have problems. It's too bad. He's a talented guy, but a lot of uh, <clears throat> drama uh, goes with it. So, just a scary thing. I have another story, but I'm not going to share it with you tonight. It's just another boring story, but it's it's rather fascinating. Uh, these characters that come in here, um, there's I'll just give you a hint. And both of them are saying the same thing about the other person, and neither one knows that the other one's talking to me as well. And they're both named Nick. That's just amazing. Uh, two Nicks in the same shop, and uh, they both think the other one's stealing from them. Uh, just a bunch of nonsense but we get this stuff all the time it's just crazy so let me check some chats <clears throat> my voice is going and see how you guys are doing it looks like the chatting is over so that's interesting we're still live it shows so bus thank you so much for joining crypto thank you pk thank you desert thank you i just want to say thanks to everyone for joining tonight uh and I'm going to have uh, Jamie make sure that we have this linkage uh, back up with all the other platforms that are out there uh, so that uh, when this new uh, filming begins, I I'm just going to push forward and find one of these, uh, a lady to do this show. Um, and that will uh, be needed so that... Uh, <coughs> we can have a bigger audience, right? This will immediately link to all the other platforms. But I want to make sure we have something that's of substance and substantial. I hope uh, some of the stuff tonight was interesting for you. It's different, but I hope uh, it didn't uh, put you all asleep. It looks like it might have put everyone to sleep. I'm sorry about that. Sorry I got a late start too. Uh, we had uh, some interesting stuff that happened today. Yeah, someone, uh, we were able to help out a nice uh, gentleman and his family with a uh, very modest uh, trailer that needs some help, but it definitely, it has a lot of space. It has a slide out, and it just uh, needs some uh, repairs uh, where the water damage is on, on the corners. And so he's going to fix that up. He's going to have a nice home, very nice home. And that's someone who's in the affordable housing crisis. There's a wonderful Hispanic family. His name is Roberto, and he is a wonderful man. He has uh, gotten a trailer for himself. He's gotten a trailer for his, uh, I think it was his father. He got a trailer for, uh, and, and then this last one here, he got a trailer for the brother. Or the brother Paige, you know, it's not like he got, he lined everyone up, brought the whole family in a truck. They li reside in Stockton, California. So when you're in Stockton, please think of Roberto and uh, all the great stuff he's doing. And he has uh, trailers that he resides in. I'm telling you, they're homes. I don't think they're not homes. These are homes for good people. And as a matter of fact, I will uh, get Roberta's phone number. I'm going to call him and let's go do a show down at his place. I think it would be really cool. Because obviously, I think if you guys remember, not obviously, sorry, this is horrible English. Uh, the reason I say that is Billy did not provide for the interview tonight. I should show you the text. It just is, it's just like clockwork. It's like, oh, you're going to be here? Yeah, I'll be here. Uh, so last night, you're going to be here? No, I'm not going to be there. I don't feel well. It just, uh, it's like a, um, uh, whatever, Bermuda Triangle, Twilight Zone, <clears throat> whatever. Uh, you know, 
uh, quicksand, and they, they just disappear. They get to they get close, and then they never show up. So I'm not going to worry about it, but I'm going to take the show to the road. So I'm going to see Roberto, super nice guy. Uh, his sister speaks English well. My Spanish isn't so good, and so she can interpret. And that would be fun to go out to Stockton to the site. I'm going to do this. So I'll ask Eden to get me Roberto's phone number. Huh. And we will do a show out there. I'll record it all and bring it back. I think that would be fun. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, close it down now because I think everyone here has gone to bed. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I appreciate you very much. If you want to check out anything uh, online regarding this show, uh, shoot over to trailercode.com. has some history, has bio on me and things like that, other things that we're doing. Uh, I need to update that site as well. If you have questions about uh, RVs, trailers, what have you, if you're uh, donating, if you need one removed, if you need to uh, purchase one, we can tell you where to go. If you need to get some ideas about how trailers work, information, we are at a, probably one of the best resources for information there is. <coughs> of a hands-on operation, uh, you know, not the RVIA, but the rest of it. So make sure you check into the... Uh, RV Dr. George website, and you'll get some good info there. Uh, if you need to t email me, please do that at trailerguyslive at gmail.com. And in the meantime, we are up to Saturday. You guys need to have yourself a great weekend, okay? Any of his family members went to work at Desert Rest? Any of his family members went to work at Desert Rest? I don't think so, but I don't know. Uh, this is a guy in Stockton. So, I will see you all on hopefully on Tuesday. And I'm going to make a, a shout out to Roberto and see if we can get down there and check that out. That would be fun and meet the family. They'll probably have some good cooking there too. I love Mexican food. Okay, everyone, take it easy. Have a great night. And I miss you all for the weekend. Be safe. Okay. Oh, big, big thing going is we have the uh, homeless feed tomorrow. So I have to make sure that that goes well. I'll try to film it. And hopefully the homeless feed goes well. And Desert, if you want to be here, that would be awesome. We're going to do hot dogs. Real simple, but, you know, it is what it is. And uh, hopefully we can have a good time. It will be sunny, and the, the homeless people will get a, a free meal. Okay, you guys take care. I'll get back with you soon, and uh, be safe tonight. Bye-bye. <laughs>